Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our Eco, Evo Eco seminar series. Uh, my name is Wout van der Bell. I'm a postdoc with UF Mank here at UBC. And I'd like to start with some housekeeping. So this Friday, there will be no talk uh, because it's May 1st, and May 1st is a holiday, which means our next talk is on Monday, May 4th where Chelsea Witt will be speaking about marine disease and parasites, I think. Uh, some other reminders. Um, I've noticed on my Twitter feed that many of you are watching our streams in quite low resolution. And just a reminder that uh, YouTube is defaulting to a low resolution in many locations right now. So if you cannot see the peaks in a Manhattan plot, for example, you might want to look at the lower right corner of your screen and get the little gear icon and uh, put it on a higher resolution. Um, I would also like to ask everyone to please spread the news about these seminars as far and wide as you can. We're very fortunate that many great speakers are uh, donating their time and effort uh, to these talks. Also, if you have missed any of the previous talks, many of them are still available on YouTube and will remain available. And lastly, I'd like to remind everyone that we'll have a Q&A session at the end, uh, which will be hosted on Slack. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, which is Professor Sarah Otto. And Sally got her PhD from Stanford with Marcus Feldman. And she's a postdoc with Nick Barton in Edinburgh. And she's currently the Canada Research Chair in Theoretical and Experimental Evolution at UBC. Uh, Sally has won numerous awards in her career. Uh, a few of them are the Sewell Wright Award, the Guggenheim Fellowship, and the MacArthur Genius Grant. Uh, she is also a fellow at the Royal Society of Canada, uh, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And finally, Sally has a long history of community service. For example, she's been uh, both the president and the vice president of the Society for Study of Evolution, and a vice president for European Society of Evolutionary Biology and the American Society of Naturalists. And with that, I'd like to welcome Sally. And uh, the floor is yours, Sally. Thank you, Walter. It's a, a real pleasure to participate in this seminar series. And I think it's great that you guys have organized it. So thank you and the other organizers. So I'm going to try sharing my screen. And then I should just stay on as a little window. There we go. OK. So the seminar I want to give today is about theory and its role in evolutionary biology. And this is work that I have been doing with Illyrio Rosales, who was a PhD student in the philosophy department at UBC and is now a postdoctoral fellow. So uh, what we, Illyrio and I have been investigating is how do equations and how does theory enter into evolutionary biology? Um, how is it used to uh, promote our understanding? And just to, to start us off, I want to pose the question, where do theoretical models come from? And for the purposes of this talk, when I say model, I'll be referring to both mathematical analyses and also computer simulations, because I think they have the same sort of role in evolutionary biology and in ecology. So of the infinite number of possible equations that one could write down, why do we choose to study the ones that we do? What role, um, where do they come from? How are they born and how are they used? So why sometimes this equation or this equation or this equation? These are just three of an infinite set of possible equations that could be written down. And so why do we write down and analyze the equations and the programs that we do. So let's take this equation, set of equations, for example. This was described in letters from the physicist Erwin Schrodinger to JBS Haldane in 1945. Crow, Jim Crow um, highlighted this example because he said, here's the rub. Nowhere in the letters does Schrodinger mention what the genetic problem is. He just gives the equations. So the equations by themselves are meaningless. They don't have any importance in evolutionary biology or in genetics by themselves. 
Um, and it's only if we are given the actual problem, the, the problematic, that these equations then have meaning. Fortunately, Crow was nice enough to give us that problematic. And that was um, a, an interest and an exchange between Schrodinger and Haldane about what happens if a farmer breeds only hornless bulls, but wants to keep all of their cows in order to avoid reducing yield in a dairy farm, say. Well, then if hornlessness is a single gene um, that was dominant, which is what they'd known from breeding, then uh, mathematically one could write down the frequency of the hornless allele in the population among the babies and the frequency of the recessive hornless phenotype among the babies. And then these would be the equations that would take those frequencies at birth, pass them through the farmer's breeding program, mating um, to the next generation. So in this context, the, the math gains meaning and it gains motivation because of questions that naturally arise in this scenario. For example, of importance are questions like how long will it take before most of the herd is hornless? If it's gonna take thousands of years, then it might not be worth it to the farmer to do this. And similarly, on the other hand, um, we might wanna know how much less efficient is this type of selection acting only on the bulls relative to selection that acted in both sexes. Because if, if it's a lot more effective to act uh, um, when selecting on both sexes, then the farmer may want to do so. So these are the questions, these, this is the thinking, this is the narrative reasoning that underlies and motivates these particular equations. How about this other equation? This other equation is kind of interesting because this exact same equation appears in all sorts of different fields. In evolution, it describes the change in allele frequency um, over time. In ecology, it describes the approach to carrying capacity. In chemistry, it's the autocatalytic, um, it describes autocatalytic enzymes and how they um, change over time. And in epidemiology, this very same equation is one of the kind of core um, uh, equations used to describe the SI model in epidemiology. And I want to um, just take a moment to say the equation that just to um, give my condolences to the many colleagues and um, friends and family of Bob May who passed away. He was a real leader in epidemiology and in evolution um, and in trying to tie our understanding of the biological world to equations like this. So, but by itself, this is just alphabet soup. It's, it's just a bunch of letters. Where uh, this, these equations gain their importance is because of how they are embedded within a narrative explanation where um, this narrative explanation is our attempt to use these equations to explain how a, a particular system will uh, move from where it starts over time to an ending point. And it's that explanation that gives the equations meaning. So I wanna step back and talk a little bit more about um, narrative reasoning and reasoning in gen general, and then um, continue in about um, narrative explanation in evolutionary biology. So there was a nice overview of um, psychological theory on narrative reasoning in PNAS in 2010 by Johnson Laird. And he pointed out that 30 years ago, psychologists believed that human reasoning depended on formal rules of inference akin to those of logical calculus. But this hypothesis ran into difficulties. First of all, from personal experience, we don't think in axiomatic if-then statements. That's just not how I go about my day thinking. But then also the types of errors that people make uh, make, uh, make it very clear that we aren't axiomatic reasoners. We make errors that, are, that make it obvious that experience and values and context come into play when we reason. And so Johnson Laird proposed an alternative view. Reasoning depends on envisaging the possibilities consistent with a starting point, a perception of the world, a set of assertions, a memory or some mixture of this, them. 
On this account, reasoning is a simulation of the world fleshed out with our knowledge, not a formal rearrangement of the logical skeleton of sentences. And I think that this quote is actually quite, um, it rings true to me about how we um, think and reason in evolutionary biology. Reasoning is a simulation of the world, an attempt to understand how it may evolve. Johnson Laird called this a mental model and Illyrio and I um, refer to it instead of, as narrative reasoning. And the reason for that is that model um, can often, oh, often evokes a very formal structured process. Um, whereas narratives allow us to uh, account and, um, and really embrace the idea that sometimes there's a lot of meandering that goes on in narratives and backtracking and their ability to skirt over, -ish, uh, over parts of one's reasoning that are maybe less secure. And so that the kind of um, uh, nonlinearity and, and variation in speed that's possible in a narrative better captures this mental simulation that we're doing of the world. So just as an example of the error in logic, errors in logic that Johnson and Laird mentioned that help us see that context matters, consider this problem. All of the French in restaurants, in a restaurant are gourmets. Some of the gourmets in the restaurant are wine drinkers. What, if anything, follows? When given that logical problem, many subjects in an experiment spontaneously inferred, therefore some of the French in the restaurant are wine drinkers. Seems very natural. But consider this variant problem. All that um, is being done is replacing this one word, wine drinkers, with Italians. All of the French in the restaurant are gourmets. Some of the gourmets in the restaurant are Italians. What, if anything, follows? And now only a very small proportion of participants in concluded some of the French are Italians. So they basically, the participants are using context and envisaging what is going on and using this kind of simulation of the restaurant and what they're imagining to draw their um, conclusions. And in the first case, they imagine a scenario where there's um, a lot of French gourmet wine drinkers in the restaurant. And this is quite a plausible um, scenario. So that's what facilitates it. This scenario building is what facilitates the incorrect inference that uh, there must be some of um, the French that are wine drinkers in the restaurant. That doesn't follow logically and necessarily from the facts that you're given in this problem. But with the second phrasing, we again use context and envision something differently, that there are French gourmets in the restaurant and that there are Italian gourmets in the restaurant. And we don't necessarily conclude that there are French Italians, which there could be because there are joint citizens in the world. So in this case, we use context to correctly conclude that nothing follows from those premises about whether the French are wine drinkers or whether they are Italians. So that is an example of how clearly we use context and past experience and knowledge when we reason and how we um, think about and analyze problems. And this is true, not just in reasoning in general about what's going on in a restaurant, but I would say and argue that it is what we do as biologists when we um, reason through problems and when we develop models. So these models, we would argue, Lirio and I argue, come from our narrative attempts to understand the world in which we mentally simulate processes that lead from a particular starting point of interest and get to a particular goal or passage through an area that we're interested in. This is the, the problem space that we're exploring both in our narrative reasoning and in our models. So we use prior knowledge, examples, counterexamples, and new information to shape this mental narrative, which means that in some cases, in some problems, we may already have worked on different, uh, we may have experimental data, we may have worked on similar models, and so some of the path may be clear because of that prior experience. And yet other parts are muddled and confused. And it's those uh, kind of obscure areas where we don't really know what's going on, which is where our mental narratives need help. So we tend to build theoretical models, 
computer simulations or analytical um, equations. In these regions of our story and our narrative where we don't understand, well, maybe the path really falls off the cliff and then you have to go all the way down the mountain and come back up. We just don't know. So it's these complex conditions that are difficult for us to reason through, which is where we place our models. That's where the models are born. I think um, I often, um, we'll talk to students and they'll be interested in, a, in developing a model, but they already know the answer to that model. Um, and so that would be an example of building models in this um, clear path. And so as a teacher, I, I try and help steer them towards kind of this more productive area where we don't know what's going on. We also build models where there are contradictory outcomes. Maybe it goes to the top of this mountain, but outside of this picture, there might be an alternative um, uh, route that the path takes. And we wanna know um, under what conditions will this be the path or an alternative outcome occur. And sometimes we build models for a different reason. And that is even if we know exactly where this path is going, we may need to have some quantitative predictions. How long is this hike gonna take? How long will a hornless allele take to spread through a population? So those are um, areas where quantitative predictions are required. But really they're in, within our narrative um, reasoning, really there are a lot of different types of places that we tend to embed our models. So in addition to these, sometimes we develop models because we have no idea what's around the corner, no idea what might happen. So we use models in this very exploratory way because our reasoning is failing us. It's too complex a situation. We have no idea what's going to happen. Or sometimes we know uh, that evolution has led to a particular um, outcome, but we don't know if that could have evolved or if a, if a dynamical system could lead to that outcome. And so we use models to bridge the gap and say, is that a possible route? And then often, and I don't think we talk about this enough, we use models to help us tell ourselves when we're wrong. So when um, we develop models and then we analyze them and they go in a completely different direction than what we expected, it, it, it tells us that our reasoning was flawed and helps us see why our reasoning was flawed. And so this happens a lot to modelers where, oh, that's not what I expected. And it helps us then go back and find another path through another narrative explanation for the phenomenon that we're interested in that doesn't lead to this um, crashing and burning of our path. So in this view, um, narratives and models um, and hypotheses and experiments all play this kind of mutualistic role where narratives define the problem space in which models are embedded, in which they're born. They lead us to uh, understand where we may be on shaky grounds and that's where we place our models. But in turn, theoretical modeling plays a mutualistic role. It can confirm the narrative and potentially extend it um, take it around a corner, where, a blind corner where we don't know what might happen, but it can also contradict our narrative understanding. It's one of the best ways to, um, for, to prove to yourself that you're wrong in your reasoning if you write down an equation and it doesn't turn out the way that the results of that dynamical equation aren't what you expected. And it's one of the best ways to convince yourself that you're just wrong in your reasoning, or at least I find it to be that way. And so then that type of contradiction leads us to seek out new mental reconstructions. Um, and so in this view of this kind of um, narrative um, modeling interchange, the more we explore our mental narratives, the more we ask, where are those weak spots? Where do we need to um, bolster our understanding through modeling? the more likely we will be to identify and reject false reasoning. So the more um, we explore, not just also one path, but alternative paths, also the more likely we will be to build an accurate account of how and why something happens. And this is really the goal in um, modeling, I would say in evolutionary biology, is this explanation. And so this is more of a kind of synergistic or mutualistic role between mathematical modeling and reasoning in evolutionary biology. And I, 
uh, was interested to read with Illyrio where some other um, philosophy of science um, studies, which really elevated the math more to a, the math captures what's really going on and the narratives are just a communication device to explain it to others. But it was the math that carried the explanatory power. And I would argue that that is not, in my experience, true in evolutionary biology. It's, the, it's really the narratives that have play that explanatory role. Um, and it's the math that strengthens and um, explores and expands that narrative. And Illyria was working on um, uh, this interpretation of narratives and, and theory in other areas too, including physics. So in this view, to better understand and teach modeling as a scientific method, then we must pay greater attention to the narrative reasoning in which models are embedded and from which they are born. We have to not just teach the equations, we have to teach the process by which we get to uh, equations and what we take out of those equations. So to illustrate that the, the, the role of narrative reasoning and its interplay with equations, I wanna talk about three examples. Uh, I'll talk about Fisher and Wright and their debate on the evolution of dominance. Uh, I'll briefly talk about Felsenstein and um, his paper on the evolution of recombination. And then I'm going to turn to um, some work that I've been doing on the evolution of sex chromosomes and even more recently on COVID, just because I think I can, it's easier for me to take the lid off of that process of how do I think about um, equations and evolution um, and share that reasoning with you. Okay, let's start off though with the evolution of dominance in Fisher and Muller. Fisher and Wright, sorry. So mutations, if they have any effect at all, tend to reduce fitness. Um, here, S is the selection coefficient against the mutation and H the dominance coefficient. But what's interesting, and this was known um, over, for over a century, is that most deleterious mutations that arise and that reduce fitness tend to be partially to fully recessive. That is, this H is nearer zero than you would expect. Um, um, than an additive or average expectation it tends to be smaller. So um, Fisher in 1928 asked himself, why do new mutation, mutant alleles tend to be recessive? And he argued there is a tendency always at work in nature which modifies the response of the organism to each mutant gene in such a way that the wild type tends to become dominant. Sewell Wright, on the other hand, proposed instead a physiological explanation and argued that increase in the activity of a gene should soon lead to a condition in which even doubling of its immediate effect brings about little or no increase in the ultimate effects. So enzymes after, um, uh, uh, oftentimes are in excess to needs within an organism. So doubling it or even having it can have little effect only if that enzyme is really reduced in efficacy uh, where we see an impact as we would when the mutant is homozygous. Interestingly, they developed um, models that led to very similar results. They used slightly different mathematical approaches. Fisher focused on the fraction of descendants that would be heterozygous and so modifiable, whereas Wright considered the dynamics at a gene that modifies dominance. But despite these different approaches, the answers that they um, got were very, very similar and they led to similar mathematical conclusions. Selection on genetic modifiers of dominance were very, was very weak. Both of them would agree with this mathematical conclusion. And the reason is that those mutant alleles that the at modifiers can act upon are rare. At mutation selection balance, the uh, mutant frequency is only mu over HS, so we're just not gonna have that many heterozygotes in a population for the modifiers to act upon. They agreed about the math, but they argued that nevertheless, Fisher wrote, considering the ratio of the periods of time available, it seems not impossible, but rather probable that the reaction of the wild type to the heterozygous phase of a recurrent mutation has in some cases at least been modified to an appreciable extent. So take a small selection coefficient, but apply it over a huge amount of time. And Fisher argued that this was the explanation for recessiveness. 
he also wrote that Professor Wright mentions another argument which should be answered as it evidently weighs with him, though the fallacy is a simple one. He says, there should always be other evolutionary pressures of greater magnitude acting in one direction or the other, and appears to think that this implies that a selective intensity of lesser magnitude has therefore no effect. Well, Sewell Wright countered, can a selection pressure of this order, of the order of the mutation rate, produce any appreciable evolutionary effect, however long it may continue? And with respect to the fallacy um, argument, Wright wrote, Fisher's recent paper goes on to expose various alleged fallacies in my reasoning. I, in turn, am unable to follow his reasoning. And so what's going on here? They agreed fundamentally on the math. Where they clashed was in their narratives. Their conclusions were irreconcilably different because they were approaching this question um, from a larger narrative context and those larger narrative con contexts clashed. And it's that narrative difference that we have to understand to understand this part of the history of evolutionary biology. Fisher's narrative, and this is very clear in his Genetical Theory of Natural Selection book from 1930, focused on the average effect of alleles. And he made a lot of mathematical progress um, by averaging across all the contexts in which an allele appears, both the genetic context in which it appears in different genomes, but also in averaging over the environments in which an organism finds itself. The resulting average fitness effect ultimately determines the long-term evolutionary outcome in Fisher's narrative explanation of evolution. And it's within this larger narrative that alleles that have a beneficial average effect would spread even if slowly, because everything else is averaged out. Wright, on the other hand, approached evolution in a different way, and he um, tended to highlight instead the interplay of forces. We see his focus on the interplay, both in Wright's distribution of allele frequencies at steady state, which is a description of how drift and selection and migration all come together to shift the relative frequencies of alleles at a locus. But also we see this interplay, of course, in the shifting balance theory, where it's the, common, the this interplay of migration and selection and drift that um, come to um, lead to the shifting balance theory. So those are very different narratives. And so the same kind of model of the same process for the modifier of dominance can then be interpreted in these narratives or placed in these narratives in very different ways. For Fisher, his argument or his worldview is that a lot of these other effects will average out over time. You know, sometimes there'll be um, random events increasing modifier, other times decreasing, and that'll average out over time. And in this view, the only thing that remains not averaged out is a selection for increased dominance. Whereas Wright had this um, a narrative view that all of these forces were at play in any one generation. And if one of the forces was tiny in any one generation and these others were large, well, then the um, outcome would be dominated by these other forces, pleiotropy, drift, and direct mutation on the modifier. So we can see how the same math in Fisher's case was used to bridge a chasm, but for Wright, it led to the conclusion that this is not the right explanation. This is not the right model. This was not just a slight difference in narratives, but a real clash and the acrimonious exchange in 1934 between Wright and Fisher basically marked the end of their previously cordial interchange of ideas. And I think we can only really understand why their communication broke down if we recognize not just this one problem that they were exploring, but how it led to a clash in their um, broader um, narrative understanding of evolutionary processes. But the opposite can happen too, where there can be conflicts and clashes in a literature, but um, we, but somebody can bring those clashing narratives together in a broader over, um, a broader encompassing narrative. And one example of this is um, from Felsenstein's 1974 paper on the evolutionary advantage of recombination. 
I recently talked about this at the uh, Allied Genetics Conference, um, so I don't want to go into too much detail here, but I will just highlight a few points in, with respect to narratives. So the, the two main papers um, that, that were, had reached diametrically opposing conclusions were one by Crow and Kimura in 1965 and one in Maynard Smith in 1968. And so I just want to show you their narrative um, accounting of the ev evolution of sex and recombination and then how Felsenstein was able to knit those two together. So Crow and Kimura were investigating mathematically a, a hypothesis that Fisher had put forward in 1930 that for unless advantageous mutations occur so seldom that each has had time to become predominant before the next appears, they can only come to be simultaneously in the same gamete by means of recombination. So in a small population where mutations are rare, then one mutation um, arises and fixes be what, long before the, the next appears. And so in a small population, um, uh, there's no problem. But in a larger population and with many beneficial mutations, if the population is asexual and has no recombination, then beneficial mutations will appear in different genetic backgrounds and cannot come together into the same gamete in the absence of recombination. And so many of these beneficial mutations are subsequently lost and it's only mutations that are nested within previous lineages carrying a beneficial mutation destined to fix. Only these nested mutations can actually fix. So Crow and Kimura calculated the amount of time between these nested mutations that could fix um, to ask how, fast does ev can adaptive evolution occur and how does that depend on the amount of sex with sex crow and kimura argued each the fates of each of these mutations is independent of one another and they showed mathematically that sexually recombining populations could adapt faster actually much faster especially in large populations with many weakly beneficial mutations where this interference where there would be many segregating mutations any one point in time and this interference would be um, huge. But Maynard Smith came to diametrically opposing conclusions using another model that seems equally reasonable. In his model, he uh, modeled a series of chromosomes um, carrying zero, one, or two copies of a beneficial allele. He assumed multiplicative interactions, which is consistent with Crow and Kimura's assumption that the fitness effects multiplied together. But he assumed that the population um, was at mutation selection balance and started out at linkage um, equilibrium. So there's these alleles were randomly associated um, at the different loci. And then he proved that if there's no linkage disequilibrium to start with, and if the fitnesses are multiplicative, then if you write down equations for the frequencies of these chromosomes, then linkage disequilibrium never builds. D remains zero throughout this process, meaning that the alleles are randomly associated. There's no correlations between which allele you're carrying at one locus and at the other locus. And as a consequence, recombination makes absolutely no difference. R drops out of the equation at D equals zero. So, so th these seem like um, completely different um, conclusions about the role that recombination plays in evolution. And what Felsenstein did was knit the two together by finding a pattern that emerges when we compare those papers which found an advantage to recombination on the left and those that did not find an advantage to recombination. And that pattern was that those that found an advantage included stochasticity and modeled a finite population, whereas those that did not find an advantage assumed a deterministic process of an infinitely large population. Why does stochasticity matter? Uh, Belsenstein um, um, basically explained explain this process uh, um, based on the outcome of um, the interplay between those kind of stochastic chance events and how selection acts on those chance events. Here's how I've put it. 
when by chance beneficial mutation alleles are found on the same chromosome, positive linkage disequilibria. So that's sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. There's just going to be variation in the associations that build by stochasticity, by drift. Selection, but when it's positive, then we have good alleles on good genetic backgrounds or bad alleles on bad genetic backgrounds. There's a lot of genetic variants. Selection becomes more efficient, leading to the rapid rise in frequency of the favored chromosome and to the rapid dissip dissipation of that linkage disequilibria. On the other hand, when by chance the opposite happens, when good alleles arise or are found on bad genetic backgrounds, um, among the offspring more than you'd expect by chance. Well, that slows selection down. Now the different um, individuals of the different chromosome combinations are more similar in fitness. And selection essentially slows down and freezes the population in this state of negative disequilibria. And as a consequence, negative disequilibria are what remain over a period of time with both drift and selection acting. I mean, here's just a cartoon um, example that um, helps us understand this. Essentially, selection uses up accessible genetic variation. For example, here in a, an initial population where bent plus alleles are favored, in an initial population, there's variation. Um, and a lot of it is accessible. The individuals with no beneficial mutations are going to be weeded out. But over a period of time with selection and, and drift in this population, one, the resulting population may still have variation within it, but that variation is now fairly hidden. Plus alleles at one locus found with, neg um, with negative alleles at other loci and other combinations. So this population that results has a lot of hidden genetic variation. It can be revealed by recombination, but in the absence of recombination, it cannot be. But of course, if the population were infinitely large, it wouldn't matter how many loci we were looking at. You would always have the, an infinite number of the most fit combination. But in any finite population, those best combinations either will be absent or could easily be lost due to drift. So selection acts in a very different way within finite populations and tends over time to lead to the accumulation of hidden genetic variation because the, um, the genetic variation that is revealed has been used up and that leaving only what is hidden, leaving only chromosomes that have good alleles on bad genetic backgrounds, which limits the response to selection. And so Felsenstein could make sense of these different um, previous narratives, previous uh, modeling results by saying, okay, well, it depends on whether or not selection is allowed to act on its own or it, it acts on the genetic variants that result from a process that includes stochasticity, random genetic drift, or the random appearance of mutations on certain backgrounds. So under this view, he could account for why sex and recombination are more advantageous and evolve over a broader range of parameters when stochasticity is included um, because of this kind of highlighting of hidden genetic variation. So I want to um, that that there, uh, I encourage you to take a look at that allied genetics um, talk if you want a little bit more detail on this particular um, aspect of the story. But I want to turn now to the recent work that I've been doing um, and explain the narrative process that I went through and trying to understand the evolution of sex chromosomes. I was part of a um, working group, a nascent working group that explored the evolutionary transitions in sex chromosomes across the tree of life and really highlighted just how dynamic sex chromosomes are um, for, um, as in this particular uh, example from um, vertebrates. So these are different X, Y, Z, W or neither um, distributions of sex chromosomes across this tree. And so we uh, were trying to understand what drives sex chromosome transitions. And um, as a modeler, I was focusing on understanding this um, from a modeling perspective. 
and all of my stories go back to Fisher and uh, he had an explanation for the evolution of sex chromosomes. He wrote, in, um, he was very much a narrative um, writer about evolutionary processes, even though he's a quantitative um, theoretician, clearly. But his narrative for the evolution of sex chromosomes went like this. Favorable selection in the Y chromosome with counter selection in the X must constantly favor those genotypes in which linkage with a sex determining portion of the Y chromosome is closest. Such selection may thus have built up the system of close sex linkage, which is now found. So he focused on these counter selection alleles that were favored on the Y, but not on the X and how they through reduced recombination would become more tightly associated with the Y chromosome and with males. Um, and that would be favored. So this is his narrative, but there are parts on this path that are a little unclear. Um, for example, uh, is it possible for alleles that are favored on the Y to be and counter selected on the X to even remain in a population or are they so ephemeral that it won't drive the evolution of sex chromosomes? Um, and how strong is the selective force for reduced recombination on sex chromosomes? Well, a series of models have indeed found that um, sexually antagonistic selection can uh, maintain polymorphism, especially in linkage with sex determining regions. And models have found that tighter linkage is generally, not always, but generally favored between that locus and the sex determining region. So in essence, if um, Fisher's argument um, holds, there, there's a sex determining region and sex differential polymorphism is maintained nearby, then that will select for reduced recombination, um, uh, causing the allele that is beneficial in males to remain on the Y chromosome more often. And this process then continues, more polymorphism is maintained, um, extending the area of reduced recombination um, and leading to more and more sex differential polymorphism. Until eventually it is argued that recombination on the sex chromosomes is either lost, or, but more often main, uh, maintained in a pseudo-autosomal region, which allows the chromosomes to align um, during meiosis. But I want to back up for a second. So that's a nice narrative, but I want to back up to this part and, and ask, is this really, this picture really true, that recombination leads to some polymorphism that facilitates another polymorphism that facilitates another polymorphism. Is there this kind of expansion or wave of um, sexually antagonistic polymorphisms that kind of uh, proceeds along the sex chromosome? Does one polymorphism help the next one to build and so on? And that, that's where I, would, I, there, I realized that there was a narrative gap in my understanding, and I didn't know the answer to that. And there was another um, uh, result in evolutionary biology that was informing my narrative and that I was borrowing from um, thinking about other processes to understand this process. And that other narrative was about um, the genomic islands of divergence where if there's selection on in two different physical locations, then um, linkage to a locus that is already in migration selection balance can facilitate invasion. That is, it's easier for a polymorphism to be maintained if it's already linked to another locus that is at migration selection balance. And this um, suggests the emergence of clusters of locally beneficial mutations can arise, which may form genomic islands of divergence, kind of this seed of one locus being under migration selection balance can proceed outwards and facilitate the maintenance of more and more and more loci um, because that first locus is reducing the amount of migration, effective migration between the populations um, because migrants tend to die and that facilitates the buildup of these genomic islands. And so what I wanted to know was, does that happen on the sex chromosomes? Do we get genomic islands of sexual divergence as we do see between different islands? 
So that motivate that 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 was the gap that I didn't know the answer to, and that motivated uh, the building of a model. So I imagine one lo locus A as a helper locus, and asked, how does the existence of polymorphism at locus A influence whether another locus can maintain polymorphism? And that's where this other set of equations came from, is, is to model this process. That's where they were born. So um, in this anal analysis of those equations, what I found was with weak selection, A provides no help, no help whatsoever. And that's because A moves back and forth between these um, chromosomes and makes really no difference on average. And that's true even if those loci are very tightly linked with weak selection, the, um, there's no facilitation that happens. And furthermore, if the A locus is really tightly linked to the sex chromosome, then it also makes no difference, even if selection is very, very strong. And then and the reason for that is that the sex chromosomes themselves, there's no migration between the, them in these non-recombining sex determining regions. So that's already as much of a cessation of migration as you could have. And so any um, locus that's tightly linked to that isn't gonna make a difference in the effective amount of migration between these um, chromosomes. There's only a, um, some kind of weird, weird conditions where this locus is polymorphic on the X and fixed on the Y. And then under some conditions, if selection is strong, that it could help. And if the B locus is not too distant, that it could help. But it's a lot of ifs in that statement. So for example, um, imagine, I'm just gonna show you, illustrate how little difference this makes on a plot like this, where I have selection of, um, uh, against B in males and against little b in females. And um, I'm going to assume that selection is additive in both sex and illustrate where polymorphism can be maintained. And if it was an unlinked um, locus on an, on an autosome, polymorphism would be maintained in this region. But if it's on the sex chromosome, and A was not there, then we would have these solid line, solid curves showing how that region in which a polymorphism um, is maintained is expanded as we get tighter and tighter to um, linked to the sex determining region, the non-recombining sex determining region. So sex linkage for sure helps a lot in maintaining a polymorphism, but the dashed line is the difference that the A locus makes. And I would, say, yes, it can make a difference, but it's a pretty tiny effect that um, we're really unlikely to be able to maintain a polymorphism because of the um, of pre-existing polymorphism than we were before. The, it, it, the chances that we fall in this teeny tiny zone are small relative to these larger zones where the polymorphism can be maintained whether A is there or not. So in summary, there's modest effects and only when selection is strong, linkage is intermediate. If it's too loose, there's no effect because the A locus moves back and forth between the X and Y. And if it's too tight, then the A is not needed because there's already no migration between the sex determining regions. So in summary, this model helped me see, I wasn't thinking about it right, that porting over this understanding of migration selection balance um, didn't work because of this anchored um, chromosomal region, the sex determining region that already didn't have um, uh, any migration between them. And so I conclude that the accumulation of sex differential polymorphism largely doesn't propagate down the sex chromosome. And instead this suggests that we might see more steps, more strata form by encompassing some of the, uh, by encompassing nearby polymorphic loci, which then extends the region of reduced recombination and captures um, and allows loci to maintain polymorphism further down the region. So th these um, models that I've been talking about really have emphasized how we are building models. I, we write down the equations when we don't really understand what's going on. And so we, these complex conditions where we're not quite sure, will polymorphism propagate down the sex chromosome or not? 
will stochasticity influence the evolution of recombination? And oftentimes there's contradictory outcomes. I can think, oh, maybe some, this will happen or that will happen. But of course, another area in which modeling is often done is when quantitative predictions are needed. And no time in my life has this been more apparent than right now, uh, where there are real needs for quantitative predictions to understand the spread of COVID. Um, and so it's been really, um, incredibly heartwarming to see modelers of all ilks throughout the world trying to pitch in and answer some of these quantitative questions such as here in British Columbia I'm part of a team that's asking how can we relax current social restrictions with the least increase in disease what are the impacts of opening schools or businesses of different sorts and in order to do that, that requires us to make a quantitative prediction on how does the R naught or the growth rate of the disease, um, one of those two measures, how does that depend on how exactly we um, affect the um, relaxation of social restrictions? And so in order to build those models, we have to include things like age structure and the contact rate, age structure in the disease outcomes and different mortality rates. So that because we need these elements in our model to quantitatively predict what opening a school might do or opening in daycare centers might do. And COVID, um, is it is also an example where modeling gen general modeling is super helpful because we know so little about this disease that many of these parameters in this model we actually don't know um, and so um, theoretical approaches are particularly helpful when we can say more general things for example in a um, project with troy day sylvain Candon, and sebastian leon we are asking how might selection be acting on covid and we're able to show that we're kind of regardless of the, of the exact parameter values in this model, um, that selection favors transmission from, these are different, sorry, I should have told you what my dots were. This is susceptible individuals exposed that are not shedding the virus yet, but have it. Um, Pre-symptomatic, don't show symptoms, feel fine, are out and about, um, and can but can transmit the disease infected with symptoms um, and recovered. There's also the possibility that individuals never experience symptoms or very, very mild symptoms and remain asymptomatic throughout. And so we can use a model, despite the fact that we don't know these parameters, we can um, find out what selection pressures are present on SARS-CoV-2. For example, finding that these transmission parameters are all selected to increase, whereas these parameters are selected de to decrease, decrease mortality, decrease transition rates, out of the pre-symptomatic phase, um, basically to keep people in this mild class longer so that they feel good and are not aware that they are carrying the disease and are then more um, able to transmit the disease over a longer period of time. So um, that, those are the types of models that I've been working on over the last few weeks. Um, and I just want to conclude by um, some broader um, reflections on theories and their um, in service of the narrative reasoning that we come to understand evolutionary biology. We build our mental simulations or our narrative narratives to make sense of the world around us. And when it's unconfusing or we're not sure what's going to happen, where our narratives are shaky, it's on that shaky ground that we place our equations. Um, and it's, it's in, only in that narrative that the equations have meaning and are interpreted. I would also can't emphasize enough how, how reasoning in evolutionary biology is so complicated. It is very easy to get it wrong. And models can help expose those weak links and tell us where our reasoning is wrong. By focusing on the narratives, we also understand better scientific disagreements, for example, between Fisher and Wright, because there was more at play than that one set of equations. It was about their narratives. It also helps us to see, oh, um, how can we put together different narrative perspectives in one overarching um, narrative that encompasses 
a kind of diversity of outcomes, which is what Felsenstein did with recombination. As a teacher, we must, uh, as teachers, we must better teach this narrative reasoning to, we have to give the kind of circuitous paths and the false starts describe how we found, uh, decided where to build a model and why we build a model and how we refine that model um, once it started to answer some questions but maybe revealed others and those refinements and extensions. We need to teach about them so that we can highlight why we place a model where we do and what we gain from it. And I would also say that this view of narrative reasoning and, and modeling um, gives us some uh, additional suggestions for how to go about our work. I think um, that our narratives are only really as good as we've challenged them. And so the more that we've thrown, uh, um, considered alternative paths, the more we've um, identified what's shaky in our reasoning and bolstered it through theory, through models or through experiments as needed, only um, then are we likely to reach an explanatory account for evolutionary biology. And so I think that there's also an advantage to talking with others and um, thinking about how our different narratives mesh or don't mesh together and why. That's one way we can challenge our narratives. And another thing I would like to emphasize is just how important it is to have different narratives and to celebrate the diversity of ways in which different people are thinking about problems and approaching those problems because it, through a kind of diversity of approaches, we're just much more likely to find the right path in our understanding of evolution. And so that, with that, I'd like to highlight especially my thanks to Illyrio Rosales, but also my mentors that have shaped my understanding of the role of theory in evolution. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sally, for that amazing talk. Uh, we, we have a couple minutes left for or some questions. Excellent. And then I'll go on to Slack and take a look at the questions after too. Exactly. Great. Um, so first question, how complex or simple should a model be to help with a narrative? In other words, is a more complex model to be preferred if it matches the empirical predictions or should we look for the bigger picture and try to develop simpler models to be older and more general? Yeah, and so and that's a really good question because it depends on how it's fitting into that narrative. Sometimes um, you uh, just are a little unsure of your logical reasoning, and then simple models can be the best because they because you can use them to understand is my reasoning correct here or incorrect, and you, it, it's really used as a thinking guide. A I'm assuming A and B will C actually follow. Um, uh, simpler models are almost always easier to interpret and to correct our reasoning if um, it's wrong. But in another case, like in the COVID example, we, we can't use the simple models. We have to have a more complex model. Um, and so especially when quantitative predictions are needed, that's where the complexity matters. But um, yeah, it, it really depends on what role that theory is meant to play. Thank you. Um, a question of mine is you briefly alluded to <clears throat> that the relationship between narratives and theory might be different in evolutionary biology than maybe in other fields like physics. Mm. I was wondering if you could allude a bit on that. Well, you, we should put this question on Slack and have Illyrio answer it. I think Illyrio thinks that the, um, but I don't want to speak too much for him. I think he thinks that it is, it does play a similar role in other sciences, but maybe isn't discussed in the same way. And he has a um, uh, good example from physics where the narrative, the, the, the kind of mental model that, um, that uh, people, that physicists, had in mind actually gave rise to the equations. It wasn't just a communications trick. It was actually um, leading to the equations. And, and I would say that there, there, are, there are some exceptions of models where the results of those models give birth to the next model. But then you go back to, well, why was that first model built? And there was a narrative um, uh, motivation for that first model. For sure. 
So follow up on the first question, is there a trade off between how much models give quantitative predictions and what they can contribute to a narrative? Say that again, what they what? Is there a trade off between how much models can give quantitative predictions and how much they can contribute to narratives? Do you have to pick? Yeah, one no, I did. <laughs> um, if there's if there's the in, in terms of um, finding out when you are thinking about something wrong and shifting your reasoning, really shifting your narrative or throwing out your narrative. I do think that if the, if everything is in your model, if the kitchen sink is in your model, it's very hard to fix how your reasoning has gone wrong because you don't know which of the many, many elements. But typically, even if we start with a complex model, we'll try and strip it down to a simpler and simpler model to say, oh, I can throw this out and this out. I still get this weird result and this out and this out until we understand um, what is generating that weird result. So I think complex models can also are, are, are useful in that regard too, but oftentimes it takes a little bit more digging um, to play that role. But again, we're not always trying to just fix our reasoning. Sometimes we're trying to predict things. So how, how do you feel about this idea that models are a metaphor for often very messy reality? And how do you see the relationship between models and data then? Are we sometimes misled by overly simplistic assumptions? I'm sure that we are often misled by overly simplistic assumptions. And that's, but, um, that's where I think seeing it not as the models are right and our thinking is wrong or the models are right and our experiments are, are wrong or what have you is just the wrong way to think about it. We're trying to um, move forward in understanding of evolutionary phenomena and the models are playing their role um, in checking our reasoning and making sure we're thinking about it right. The experiments are filling in gaps where we're not sure what's going on. And it's that interplay that I think moves us all forward um, faster. The, um, the other thing that is really important to do is, um, generally is to see how robust your reasoning is. That's what I'm saying. A model is useful in showing how robust your narrative thinking is, but it's also um, important to ask how robust is my model? Is it, will I get, the, even if it does support my narrative reasoning, is that just because it's of the simplifying assumption that I've made, for example, assuming an infinite population, and do I get similar results if I um, expand the model and make it more complex and account for some of that, those real world um, uh, 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 elements. All right, one last question then. Um, what do you see the role uh, of machine learning and AI to be in these kind of questions? Mm. Uh, what can they contribute to our understanding evolution, given that it might be much harder for them to fit into our narrative? Yes, I think that is the um, million dollar question. When, if all you want is prediction, then maybe machine learning is the tool for, for you. Um, if what you want to do is understand, it can be harder. But, but I think the latest generations of machine learning algorithms are trying to give us more insight into what, what exactly is a machine learning when it's learning? What are those signals? And then we can develop simpler models to focus on those signals. Great, thank you very much, Sally. Yeah. Uh, we'll thank we'll you. keep it at that, I think. Okay. Um, so our next talk will be not on Friday, but on coming Monday, May 4th. Uh, also Star Wars Day, I think. So that should be fun. And uh, <laughs> uh, for the rest of you, stay happy and healthy and stay at home. And we'll see each other again on Monday. <laughs>